people before the service, we were here prepping, and I was saying, oh, I feel like I've got so much time. There's, everything's ready, you know, it's nice to be back. And then we're in the prayer meeting, and I realized I don't have a mic, and I'm meant to be preaching. And so I'm a little out the loop, but excited to be back, and so clearly I need some prayer. So can we pray as we go into the ministry of God's Word um, this morning? Let's pray together. Here, yeah, Father, thank you. Thank you that we can gather this Friday morning, this beautiful Friday morning, to look at this event, this event in history that just changes so much of all that we do as your people. It changes the way that we can relate to you. It changes the way that we can come to you. And it changes the way that we can gather together. And so I pray, God, as we look at your word, as we, as we unpack some of the blessings that come through your death, would you just inspire us, God? Would you open our hearts? Would you help me, God, to communicate clearly your word that we would appreciate and apprehend and bring near all of these wonderful truths um, as we think about Good Friday and what that means for us? And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. It's great to be back. I'm really excited to be sharing. And if, if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to turn to Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verses 19 to 25 is where we're going to land this morning. Uh, and it will be on the screen, but I do want to encourage you to, to bring your Bibles. just want to take this opportunity to do that. I think it's a, a really good practice. It's something that we can then engage with as we have the Word open in front of us. We can highlight and take notes. Uh, and particularly when we deal with some passages, some of the, the things that we're looking at really are linked to the words and the phrases that we find in the passage, and so it's really helpful to have that in front of us. But I just want to encourage you, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 25. And I was thinking about um, one of the homes I lived in as a child, and uh, we had this really cool lounge, right? It was one of the like sort of places we'd host these little movie nights there. And my friends loved it because it sort of, you came in and then you'd, you'd go up, it was sort of raised off the main sort of level. So you went up three stairs and you came into the lounge and it was this big square room and you had this sort of entertainment system, the TV and stuff all on one wall. But we had this curtain that would go all the way around the whole room. It sort of linked the whole way around, except for obviously the TV because that would defeat the object. Um, and so you could close the room to the point that you actually couldn't tell where the entrance was. You couldn't tell where the exit was, and it would sort of black out everything else. So my friends thought this was great because we could develop a game out of this, right? We could bring new people who hadn't been to my house before, and we could bring them into the lounge blindfolded, spin them around, and see if they could find their way out. And it was sort of something we did just to amuse ourselves because we were teenagers, and that's just what we did. And so often, some people would almost fall down the stairs. That was quite funny to us. But we would just sort of, it was just this process of like, you spin around, you go, I actually don't know where the exit is because the curtain has gone all the way around, and, and it's sort of trying to figure out where we'd gone, and so it's a silly little story, but really, there's so many events that happened when Jesus died on the cross. One of the things that happened was we hear about this curtain in a temple that splits in two, and something in that event is significant for us today. Something in that event is significant for us today, and there's something as well in, that, in the, st the story about my curtains about is the, is the fact that also there's something about being on the other side and then looking back to where we came from. There's something about going through a curtain and going, well, what's on the other side? Pulling back the curtain. And so really that's what I want to do with us this morning. It's one of the things I want to really focus on because behind the curtain that was torn on Good Friday was not just a cool lounge, but all of the blessings that God had in store for us in Jesus and so as Jesus dies for our sin and breathes his last, this curtain splits in two. And I want to look at the significance of that for us today. So we can turn to Hebrews chapter 10. The passage really highlights some of this reality for us. But um, I, I, I kind of want to do a bit of a backwards day today. And we're going to read the passage, and then we're going to sort of work our way through it backwards. And I'll, I'll sort of highlight that as we go. Because the, the passage is really structured quite simply as there are these two realities Right, the author of Hebrews has sort of got to this point. He's been unpacking all this deep and, and, and sort of rich theology for chapters upon chapters, really linking back into the Old Testament. Hebrews is one of those books that's really difficult to understand, but so rich. It takes a lot of effort, but it is so rich. And he gets to this point in his, in his book, and he's writing, and he's like, okay, now we're going to start to bring in some exhortation, some application, some encouragement and he, he sort of summarizes some of the theology in these two realities, and then he calls us to action. He calls us to action. He gives three encouragements. Let us do this. And so let's read together and unpack that. Hebrews chapter 10, 
verse 19. Therefore, based on what we've heard, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, he has inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed pure in water. Let us hold to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. And as you can see, there are these two sort of phrases right at the beginning, since we have this, and since we have this. He sort of starts with these two realities for the Christian. He then lands in, let us do this, let us do this, and let us do this. These are the calls to action we should make as Christians, and they're the blessings available to us as Christians because of the two realities he has stated. And in the most cheesy way possible, the way I like to remember this is they're the three lettuces, right? They're the three lettuces. I'm so sorry, I will see myself out, okay? But that's just, if that just helps you to remember it, it's one of the best ways I can sort of get my brain there, is we're told, let us draw near. Let us, in some translations, I like to say, hold fast. Let us consider one another. You see, after all the theological teaching that this author has, has done with all of his hard work in the Old Testament, we know the author of Hebrews was someone really rooted in the Old Testament, probably really like wise in understanding all the links and all of the systems of the temple, and then applying it into the message of Jesus. And as he's done all of this work, inspired by God, he's now compelled to call us to these three things, to draw near, to hold fast, and to consider one another. And I want to briefly look at those and then go back to the foundation because it's backwards day. Okay, we're starting with the exhortations and then we go back to the grounding we have for those. The grounding that we have for this. And so the first one is, let us draw near. I don't know if you've ever been in a position where you found yourself somewhere you weren't sure you were meant to be. Right? I don't know if you've ever found, and, and the only story I could think of was I had this friend, whose name I will not mention, who found himself at a wedding reception and slowly came to realize he was not actually meant to be there. He was not invited. He got confused between the two types of invitations. So they sent out two invitations, one for the ceremony, which was bigger. People could come and watch the vows and see the kiss and all exciting. And then some people who were you know, in the circle of friends could then get an invitation, and they were going off sides, a sort of 45-minute drive um, to go and watch the sort of reception and dance and eat the food that had been provided, and there was that invitation. Unfortunately, my friend got confused, and he found himself out there, and I remember hearing about this. I remember seeing some people joking. I thought, am I invited? Did I get the second invitation? And I started to sort of doubt my own presence there, and luckily, everyone was very okay. They got a seat for him. We made some plan. We shared some scraps. It all worked out. Everything was okay. But I don't know if you know that feeling where you sort of start to doubt, am I meant to be here? Am I meant to be in this place? Do I belong here? Do I have the confidence that I should be here? And this, this phrase, let us draw near with boldness, with full assurance of faith. It means to have a vivid sense of freedom from all fear that is associated with entering God's presence. It's, it's a vivid a vivid sense of being free of fear that I shouldn't be there. It's, it's the opposite of, of, of feeling that fear. It's saying, I know I should be here. Because on my wedding day, I didn't have that worry. I didn't need an invitation. It was my wedding day, it was my reception, I'm eating the cake, okay? I know I'm meant to be there, okay? That's the assurity we are meant to have because of Jesus when we come into God's presence, we don't have to have trepidation, do I belong? We don't have to have trepidation, am I worthy? We don't have to have this worry, am I going to be cast out or rejected? No, we have this full assurance that we can enter into God's presence, boldly pursue Him, knowing we're not only permitted, we're called. We're not only allowed, we're encouraged. God says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. There is a cleansing that happens when we put our trust in Jesus 
that gives us confidence to not only approach God, but to seek him and to seek intimacy with him. This is an encouragement to believers. Becoming a Christian is not the heart of intimacy for us. It's the start of a relationship where we get to seek God personally and personably and know him intimately. And so we're told the first lettuce, I did consider bringing three actual lettuces and sort of throwing them out as like, but I thought maybe that was a bit too far. That's more Jason's domain than Ryan's domain. So I thought I'll stick to what I do. And, and so we, have, sorry, Jay. And so, and so the first lettuce is let us draw near. The second lettuce is we are encouraged to persevere in our hope. We're told to hold fast, to, to bed in. I, I, another story I remember was we had, the, I had this friend who was needing some help to move. And so we were moving him, and he was, he was moving into a flat that was on sort of, it was part of a house, but it was like the second story. First story, I think you say here. Sorry, I'm so confused. Okay, but one up from the ground, right? And so we, we're doing this. We're helping. They've got some snacks and drinks for us. This is all very fun, and we're, we're glad to be of service until we get to his couch, which cannot get through the door. But we need this couch. It's an important couch. And so, and so we, <laughs> these are the type of people that really make a plan. And so we construct this really crazy pulley system off their balcony to wrap pulleys like ropes around the, the couch. And to, I mean, it's a three-seater couch, right? And to then pulley it up the wall and over the balcony. And at one point, in order to sort of go around and, and, I don't know, work on one of the things that needed to happen, I was sort of left at the top holding. And he said, I'll be right back, okay? I just need to go down, just hold in there. And I'm thinking, oh no, okay, what's going to happen? Now luckily, nothing bad happened, but I remember, th I remember thinking about this, thinking about this phrase of hold fast, and, and, the, and the sort of encouragement we were given is, because he who promised is faithful. Now, if I thought my friend had any intention to go off and have a drink somewhere and sort of have a, have a lunch while I'm sat there holding his couch suspended over a balcony, I probably would have let go because I think this is not worth the effort. But I knew his heart, I knew his character, and you know, it doesn't take much to be a decent person and go down and actually come back and help. And we got the couch over, but it was that. It was this f sense of knowing that we can hold on no matter how tired our arms get. No matter how draining this life gets, no matter how hard the Christian walk gets, we can hold fast, endure, persevere, because he who promised is faithful. Because he who promised is faithful. As hard as it can be, the Christian life is a life of perseverance because we have hope in God. And the third lettuce to throw out there is lastly, we're told to consider one another, to consider each other, to encourage each other. And it's explicitly linked to us gathering as believers. There's this specific link to say what we do as Christians is yes, we draw near to God with intimacy. We hold fast and endure in this life in perseverance and faithfulness, but also we gather and we encourage. We gather and we help one another. We push one another forward. It's, it's, it's something we're meant to do. And I thought back to that story because, you know, it's a three-seater couch. So some of you might be wondering, how was Ryan holding that up by himself? To be fair, I wasn't. There was one other guy on the other end. And he looked over to me and said, it's okay, Toddles, we can do this. We can do this. We can hold this. Just hold in there, right? And that's the thing. That's what it means to gather together, to say we need one another, to encourage each other, to persevere. The Christian life is lived in community, not in isolation. See, the... These are the encouragements. He's, he's worked his way 10 chapters of theology, of deep teaching, of unpacking the Old Testament and understanding it in light of Jesus and unpacking everything that's going on. And then he gets to his application and the three things that we are called to do are seek intimacy with God, okay, to persevere in faithfulness and to encourage one another as we gather but now why and how can we do this? Well, this is where we go to those foundations. The, the foundations we have for reaching new hearts. Because all of Hebrews, I was thinking about if I could give like, this would be a good like, sort of fun task to do, to give each book of the Bible a theme song, right? I thought that would be really fun to do. And if I had to give the book of Hebrews a theme song, it would be simply the best. I had to fight the urge not to sing that, okay? Simply the best. Because 
all of Hebrews is the author saying Jesus is the better priest. And this temple is the better temple. And this covenant is the better covenant. Okay, what was there was okay. It was good. But Jesus' way, the new way, is the better way. It's simply the best. And so we have these two realities. And you, and you can maybe look at it if you have it in your scriptures. The first one, which is actually the second one because it's backwards day, right? Ryan's just throwing everything out the window, yeah? Is this. We have a great high priest. Since we have a great high priest we can do these things. And what he's doing is is actually one of the last things he's been doing before he got to the section is showing how that Jesus, as our priest, is better than the priesthood that was before. Right before in Israel, in God's people, the Levites served as priests, and there would be a high priest, and they would serve the people in offering sacrifices for sin. But in many ways, Jesus is better You see, while there were many Levite priests and some would come and go, Jesus is one. While they were temporary, Jesus was permanent and eternal, or is permanent and eternal. While there are sinners who need sacrifices themselves, he is holy and innocent. And while they had to sacrifice daily, he sacrificed once and for all. They offered up animals, he offered himself. Okay, They came through the man-made structures and tents, He came into the very presence of God by his own blood. And so we have in Jesus a great high priest and a mediator. But the second reality is this. We have, since we have, boldness to enter. And then we get this phrase. This is where the curtain comes in. Then we get this phrase explaining why we have this boldness. Because it's through his blood And through his blood, he's opened a new and better way through the curtain. And then the author says, which is his flesh. See, because of Jesus' sacrificial death on our behalf, we have boldness. We have confidence to come into the holy places because of what Jesus did. Because as Jesus' flesh was torn, so was every barrier between us and God. That's what it means when we say the curtain is torn. That when Jesus' flesh was torn, Every barrier between man and God was torn as well, destroyed. For those who don't know, the the temple curtain was this curtain that had been built in the temple to separate the holy place where people would serve, the priest would serve, and what was called the most holy place. It represented a barrier of sin between man and God because only once a year could one person, the high priest, go into that place on the day of atonement and make sacrifice for sin. Only one person, once a year, it represented the very inner part of the glory of the temple where God's presence was. It was 18 meters high and nine meters wide. It wasn't an accidental tearing. It was a supernatural tearing meant to tell us something, that as the sky went black and Jesus breathed his last, all the barriers were removed The curtain was torn and that very presence of God was opened up to us to come into. This is how we can do what we do as believers. See, let's return to the produce aisle. Go back to our lettuces, okay? These realities enable these actions because we can draw near to God in intimacy because we have boldness to enter because the curtain is torn. We can hold fast in endurance because of the death of Jesus, because in his death we see God is faithful and he is coming again. He keeps his promise. He who died for us will return for us. And we can consider one another and encourage one another because the death of Jesus has brought us together and united us through his blood and inspired us to love one another as he loved us. That's what's on the other side of the curtain. That's what is available to all who trust him. And this is the fresh start that we have available to come through the curtain of the death of Jesus and into a greater life of intimacy with God, perseverance with hope, and a community of encouragement. And so for many of us, we hear this, and it might be the very first time, probably not in this room, but maybe someone listening online, but for many of us, hearing this is available to us could be the first time 
we recognize God is calling us through the curtain. It's torn because of Jesus' blood. And we can come into relationship with God that is available. But even for us who've known Jesus for many years, it's because the curtain is torn that we are now encouraged to still today draw near, hold fast, and encourage one another in community. And so I want to ask you, what is the next step for you in those spaces? Where's the fresh start for us today? As we know that Jesus' blood has purchased for us a new and living way through his death, where can we draw near? How can we hold fast? And how can we continue to encourage one another and consider one another as we gather together? Let me pray for us and then we'll enter into communion. God, thank you for the gift of Jesus. We, pr we praise the lamb who was slain. And we know that as his flesh was torn and the curtain was torn in two, again we celebrate every barrier. Every barrier was removed between us and you. There is nothing holding us back from coming to you, God, to seeking you, to knowing you, and to following you. And so help us, God, in that confidence, in that boldness, to draw near, to hold fast, and to consider one another, and all the more as we see the day approaching, the hope to come. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.